Hi, welcome to this lecture on Envarta adaptation of animals. Now we will focus more detail on the breathing of certain animal groups. And we will start with ectothermic vertebrates, fish, amphibians and reptiles. And but before that, uh, we want I want to have a short review on how different vertebrates are able to increase this gas exchange. So far, we have learned that some animals have high aerobic capacity and that's why they need more oxygen from the environment. And the easiest way is that increase the size of this gas exchange membrane. So if you have larger area, then the diffusion is easier from the environment to in internal body fluids. And that's why these athletic animals usually have larger surface area in the lungs or the chills. Well, and then the other way is that, okay, because the diffusion, rate of diffusion depends on the distance that, for example, the oxygen must diffuse. So that's why if you have thinner gas exchange membrane, then diffusion is faster. Okay, let's focus a little bit on different animal species. On the ectothermic animals, these larger animals have naturally larger gas exchange membrane. They have larger lungs or larger gills because they are larger. They need their the metabolic rate is for, uh, uh, is is bigger in bigger animals. But actually, it doesn't matter if you have gills or lungs. So in the fish or amphibians or in the in the reptiles, the area versus your body weight is quite similar. So that's why the oxygen from the environment can be as well transported to the circulation in all these animals. But then we have animals with high metabolic rate, mammals and birds and tunas. In our cases, this uh, gas exchange membrane is way larger. And this means then that, okay, we have larger area. We have, e it, it's easier to increase the diffusion of oxygen from the environment to the cir circulation. But what about then on the thickness of this membrane? In a typical fish sheet, uh, there's maybe five to 10 micrometer distance from the environment to circulation. And it's not related on the animal size. So all size animals have the same thickness, but these large animals have just large, larger area. But then when we are comparing on terrestrial animals, it's maybe one fifth or one tenth of the thickness of the fish chills. So this means then that okay, the diffusion of oxygen or carbon dioxide is much faster from the environment to the circulation. And it doesn't matter if you are ecto or endotherm, so in mammals or turtles, we are as good in, in, this, uh, in this thickness, as well as in the uh, yellow fish tuna. So these tunas are also having quite good. So it doesn't matter that, okay, they have these chills. They are as well as good in this uh, diffusion speed as, as, as these uh, animals with, uh, with lungs, except the birds. The birds, they have this cross uh, current gas exchange. And in this, this distance from the air the circulation is very small. And this makes that, okay, they are very efficient to take the oxygen from the environment. Okay, we have chills and we have gills, uh, chills and, and, and lungs, but also we have skin. Although in humans, it's only a few percent of the oxygen or carbon dioxide is transported through the chin skin because in the mammals and birds we are reducing the water loss and that's why the skin is also impermeable for the gases. But in most vertebrates they are increasing the gas exchange area 
by having a gas permeable scheme. And they can even regulate it. So, so they, it can be uh, permeable for oxygen or carbon dioxide. There is a lot of variation on aquatic fish. So in some fish, maybe 10% of the oxygen is coming from the environment through the skin. But in some other, other fish species, over 30%. Then we have these semi terrestrial animals. There are some animals that are not adapted on, on dry environments. And they are relying on the skin very drastically. There are uh, some bullfrog larves, but also adult bullfrogs are uh, having almost all the car carbon dioxide is emitted through the skin. And then, of course, there is an exception. There is a lungless salamander with no lungs. 100% of the oxygen is coming through the skin. 100% of the carbon dioxide is excreted through the skin. And then we have these fully terrestrial vertebrates, turtles and, 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 and lizards. Even then, they can have over 10% of the carbon dioxide or even on the on the oxygen can be transported through the skin. So the skin seems to be an additional organ for this gas exchange. But let's focus now on the breathing of fish. Most probably you have opened uh, fish in your life and seen that okay, how this arch are there under this external flap. And if you open the mouth, you can guess that, okay, the water is going inside the mouth on this buccal cavity. And then there are this chill arch and chill filaments through which the water goes to another cavity. It's called opercular cavity. And then behind this flap, the water is flowing out from the, on the, from the fish. And the water is flowing from the buccal cavity to upper cavity through these chills. And this chill, each chill arch have two rows of chill filaments. And there are two kinds of uh, blood vessels. There are afferent that are coming from the heart and efferent that are go, uh, taking the blood to other parts of the body. And these filament vessels are rotating each chill filament and the water is flowing one direction only and each of these filaments are having bears of series of folds so so-called secondary flamels and the lamels are on one direction beside which the water is flowing on one direction and the blood is streaming on the opposite direction. There are 10 to 40 uh, lamels per millimeter and there's a cross current in the circulation of water flow. And in the even closer look, now you can understand that, okay, this is the way place where the gas, uh, so meaning oxygen is, is, is transported from the environment to the circulation. And because you have this cross current uh, mechanism, then this can be quite effective to take the oxygen from the environment. Okay, how the fish can maintain this or regulate this uh, breathing? It's using a pumps. It has two kind of bumps, one in the buccal cavity, the, it's pressure pump, so it's pressing water through the chills. And then on the other side of the chills, we have opercular suction pump, so we are sucking water from the mouth through the chills. So this buccal pressure pump is working quite simply. So when it's opening the mouth, the floor of this buccal cavity is is lowering, which means that, okay, the mouth is larger. 
and when you are, the, a fish is closing the mouth and rising the floor, it increases the pressure. And that's why the water tries to flow somewhere else. And where it can flow, it can flow through the chills because there are some valves that are preventing the water flow from the mouth. And on the other hand, there is this uh, operacular suction pump that is sucking the water through these chills. It could also suck it from the environment, but there is operacular rim valve that is closing the uh, this cap, and that's why it can go. Uh, all the water is coming through the chills. Okay. How these pumps are working together. When the fish is filling the buccal cavity, these both pumps are sucking. And that's why there's some water flowing through the chills. Then, when the mouth is closed, the buccal valve is increasing the pressure, but this opercular cavity is still expanding. So, all the water in the mouth is going from uh, through the chills to this opcular cavity. And li even late, a little bit later, this opcular rim valve is opened and these both pumps are removing water from the animal. And then the buccal cavity starts to refill and that's why there is no flow of, of water through the chills, but because uh, what other the, the this latter cavity is re still reducing, but the water is flowing out from the uh, from the from the anima. Okay, we have these pumps that we can, uh, the animal can increase several fold the the flow of water through the chills when they are increasing the activity of these pumps. The other way how to in, in, uh, increase the flow is by uh, swimming fast and it's called ram ventilation. So if the animal is moving 50 centimeters per second, meaning uh, a little bit less than two kilometers per hour, you don't need these pumps at all. And that's why many f uh, fast swimming fish use this ram ventilation they don't need energy for the breathing they need it for the swimming and and some athletic species are obligatory ram ventilation they can't even use these pumps and that makes that okay these tunas if they stop they will die and the problem in this fast swimming and this ram ventilation is the speed of the water flush it could tear these fine structures of these secondary lamels in part and because the fine structure is essential for this countercurrent gas uh, transportation and that's why these tunas they have additional structure there to keep the secondary structure stable okay what about then in the aquatic animal and for example human what about how how if they can regulate this respiration the aquatic animals usually in the environment there is not so much oxygen available but the good point is that okay you can easily excrete all the car carbon dioxide so that's why these they don't have so much problems in the car carbon dioxide accumulation and if you are increasing the pumping you can increase the ventilation by 30 fold and how you can measure it you can measure either from the environment or from the circulation the party pressure of oxygen in mammals we also have oxygen sensors but more often we are sensing carbon dioxide well our blood has very high carbon dioxide levels and that can be so we have much more problem on the carbon dioxide accumulation 
Then, beside these regular fish, we also have air breathing fish. So about 400 species are able to breathe air. Most of them have also chills for breathing in the water. But we have a lot of variants. So some of them are breathing through the skin or with the buccal air gobbling. So they are swallowing air. And then they can have these vascularized papillae in the, in the buccal cavity, or they can use chill chambers, or they can have, in some cases, amphibian-like lung structures, like in this lungfish, from which we can then turn on the amphibians. In the tadpoles, they have chills, Nothing to relate on, on, the, on, the, on the chills in the fish, because these are external fish. They are in different paths, for example. And usually these are lost during the metamorphosis, but not always. And if they are having lungs, these lungs are like two sacs with undivided cavities. So these divisions are less developing than in, for example, the lungfish. And these inner walls of the lungs are often more elaborated and they look quite much like some kind of honeycomb. But they are quite simple uh, and quite uh, easy way to have the lungs. You have just sac. And the breathing is working quite much the same way as in the fish. So they have this, use this buccal cavity and buccal pharyngeal pumping in the respiration. So they will fill the buccal cavity from, the, uh, from mouth or nourish and the glottis between the mouth and lung is still closed. After that, they will open the glottis and the, the pulmonary air is exhalated. After which this fresh air is pressed in the lungs. Not very efficient. Uh, but it's good, uh, much better than the chills, especially when do, do being on, on the terrestrial environment. So when we have these tadpoles, this chills and skin is equal used for gas exchange. You know, uh, they are about the same rate in, in, the, in, the, in the oxygen uptake as well as in carb carbon dioxide excre excretion. Then, when the tadpoles are maturing, they are developing these lungs. But in the, their role in this gas exchange is very small. So it means that most of the oxygen is actually coming through the, uh, through the skin. Then, during, after the uh, post-metamorphic frog land, uh, let's, these lungs are used as the main source of oxygen uptake. But you can see that the role of the lung in the getting rid of the carbon dioxide is minimal. So they are using the skin as well as even in the adult, adult, adult frog, almost all carbon dioxide is eliminated by the skin. So it means that, okay, the, the respiration is not so efficient, but it doesn't matter as long as your, your skin is moist. What about then on the reptiles? These reptiles have impermeable skin, and that's why the gas exchange happens in the lungs. The lungs can be either like the sac of the amphibian, so they can be uni unicamellar, or they can be multicamellar, so it can be subdivided with larger uh, surface area. And they are now using different way. They are not anymore using the same muscles as the fish and the amphibians, but they are using this aspiration. So they are expanding the lung volume to get air in the lungs and they are using the similar muscles as we humans do. Thank you.